Well, uh, thank you all for joining us today for this uh, special event with uh, US National Cyber Director Chris Inglis. I'm Ben Scott, and I direct the rules-based order project here at the Lowy Institute. Of course, cyberspace is great, but we're really glad to be having in-person events back here at the Lowy Institute. The traditional owners of the physical space on which we meet today are the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I want to begin by paying my respects to their elders, past and present. I'd also like to welcome representatives we have here today from the governments of Japan, Canada and the Netherlands, and of course, the United States. This event reached capacity in record time. I think that shows the intensity of the interest in this topic but also in our very distinguished guest. I can think of no one more qualified to talk to us about the state of cybersecurity and geopolitics today. Just under a year ago, Chris Inglis was confirmed by Congress as the first ever US National Cyber Director. He is a principal advisor to President Biden on cybersecurity policy and strategy and cybersecurity engagement with industry and international stakeholders, us. Director Inglis began his career in the Air Force. He spent 28 years at the National Security Agency and rose to become its Deputy Director. Not an easy job, but one he fills for seven and a half years. I'm going to invite Director Inglis now to come and make some remarks from the podium. After that, I'll ask him a few questions on the stage, and then we'll take a few questions from you. Thank you very much, Director. Thank you very much, and uh, we very much appreciate the warm welcome we've received in Australia. Um, at every turn, and we've had some terrific discussions. This is an alliance, a partnership that continues to prosper, largely because of the collaboration and the common values that underpin it. Um, I think also I'm just really pleased to be in the presence of so many of you, so many of us. I, I used to quip that after my time at NSA, it took me a couple of years to learn how to speak in the presence of natural light. Um, but here we are after COVID, or perhaps kind of on the tail end of COVID, um, kind of learning to speak in the presence of one another, and it's a joy. So it's very, very um, welcoming to be here because I think it's really hard to root out two million years of human evolution in one generation, uh, which then causes me to turn to cyber. I'm going to make a few very brief remarks, framing remarks, which hopefully then sets up a question and answer session where we can explore areas of interest to you. Um, the first remark I'd like to make is to perhaps set the context of cyber. Um, what is cyber for? And I do that by beginning with a question that a colleague of mine, Jeff Moss, often asks at this moment. He's the person who started Black Hat and DEF CON, and we're on our way to Black Hat Asia in Singapore to have a further discussion with him, kind of in the public domain. But he asked the question of why do race cars have bigger brakes? It's an odd question to start a cyber talk with. He quickly answers, so that they can go faster. Right? That's a really interesting question to lift and shift into cyberspace. We have to ask, why do we do cyber? Um, I might be accused as the national cyber director within the United States of being a cyber hammer in search of a cyber nail, that all things have something to do with cyber. But I have to actually, honestly, hum humbly kind of understand that cyber doesn't exist for its own sake. We don't do cyber for cyber's sake. We don't do IT, information technology, for its own sake. We do it so that we can achieve our personal aspirations, our business aspirations, our societal aspirations. And we therefore need to make sure we get that alignment right. We need to make sure we understand what we want to do with this space make the necessary investment so that the space will then have a chance to deliver on that, and then not so much obsess with the threats to it, but get on with those positive, compelling aspirations forward. That then leads me to point two, which is, well, how are we doing this? I'm reminded of the anecdote of a chief executive officer, could be an agency or department head in the government, but a senior in an organization who was walking around that organization one day, happened to see the word cyber on a doorframe, thought boldly, I'll go in and see what this is all about. I've read so much about it. And happens to encounter someone who's in charge of defending right, the business on digital infrastructure, the so-called chief information security officer, and asks the following questions. Like, so I've read so much about this. I'm the CEO. You're the CISO. That's the term of art. How are we doing? And the CISO, being somewhat intimidated, said, in a word, I'm good. Right? The CEO then pressed on, thinking there's a really good story here, that he might be able to share that with the board, said, how, about, how are we doing in two words? Two words, not good. Right? <laughs> now, it turns out both of those answers are, are relevant right, to where we are in cyberspace. Right? There are so many reasons for us to believe that cyberspace is delivering on our expectations. Right? We were able to, in record time, kind of develop a vaccine and deploy that, requiring some, no small amount of miracles in terms of the exchange of information, 
coordination and synchronization that's only possible on the internet cyberspace as we know it today. Um, turns out that we can solve problems of equal or greater magnitude if we get this right. Um, and that happens every day. So there's reason to say that it's good. There are reasons also to say not good because there's so many challenges in this space that thwart our efforts to do what we want to do individually, kind of organizationally at the business level or even at the governmental level. Um, those of you who follow this space closely would know that attacks like Not Petra or WannaCry, which were nation state attacks in the year 2017, had an extraordinary effect on, on the commerce, um, the business um, that was essentially coursing across the internet at that time, but more importantly had an effect, a, a, an attack on the confidence of people who would then say, should I perhaps stay in this space? Should I do the new thing in this space? Should I extend my aspirations, my reach a bit further? So it's not just data and systems that are at risk. It's not just the critical functions that rely on those data and systems that's at risk. It's the confidence of our societies. When you think about the ability of cyberspace to hold free, fair, open elections at risk, not because there's the possibility of changing votes, but there's the possibility of influencing broad populations, we have to consider how do we then make sure that cyberspace plays its appropriate role to deliver what we expect of it the integrity, the availability, the confidence that those things that we inject into the space will be fairly represented and come back to us from that space. It's not a political choice. Um, that's not a, even a value choice. You just want cyberspace to do what it's supposed to do. Um, the third frame then is if, if at the end of the day um, we have some challenges in this regard, um, I would begin by saying that as I suggest strategy, we have to understand whether that answer of good or not good is fate or choice. I think it's choice. I think we can choose to invest in this space in various ways that I'm about to suggest. Um, we can choose to invest in this space such that it meets, exceeds the confidence that we need to have that it will do our bidding. Or we can choose not to, which has largely been the story of the last 40 years. We can invest in the primary functions and race ahead on the visible performance, perhaps the bandwidth, the ability to access broad swaths of data but without giving time and attention to the resilience that's necessary to deliver that with the full faith and confidence that we prefer, um, we can choose by our inaction, by our complacency, to get the result um, that too often we get today, where we obsess because um, those, those threats are real. We obsess about those threats. Those choices, then, if we make them, essentially have to come down to we have to get the doctrine right, roles and responsibilities. We have to get the skills right. And we have to get the technology right. Now, I mentioned it in that particular order because so often the discussion about cyberspace starts and ends with technology. Right? There's, no number, there's no small number of technologies that are kind of trumpeted that would kind of be brought to bear to solve one or another problems in this space. Generally, they react to, respond to some pratfall that occurred last week or something that's occurring at the moment. And they will kind of solve that problem in isolation, perhaps through the soda straw that you're looking at on the map. They'll solve that problem. But too few of them are holistic in nature and essentially solve the real problem, which is we don't have the roles and responsibilities right. We don't know who is accountable for what. Imagine for a moment that you're a user of technology where no one took particular responsibility of building cyber resilience in. It then populates down what we would describe as a supply chain. And you're at the end of that chain, and you inherit this technology. The resilience, the robustness of it is an afterthought. It'll catch up later. Um, who is now the poor soul that has to then deal with that resilience and robustness that's not been built in? You. Um, who, what kind of capabilities do you have? What resources can you bring to bear to solve all of the investments, to inject all of those investments, let alone to know something about the nature of the space you're operating in? Precious little. Um, imagine if we built and deployed cars that way, that there's no air safety bags in them. There's no analog brakes in them. There's no locking mechanism on it. Um, there's, no, there's not even a set of brakes that you can guarantee make it through the first 5,000 kilometers. And you enter into a road system that is not designed with safety in mind. It's simply designed to get you from point A to point B, but it's your issue as to whether you do so safely. We don't have road systems like that. We don't have cars like that. We don't have airplanes or drugs or therapeutics like that. We've invested as necessary to get those systems into the right place because we first attended to the doctrine, the roles and responsibilities. We then got the people skills up to speed, such that not simply the experts who actually develop, deliver, perhaps sustain those systems, but the people who use those systems know something about, in the role of an automobile, how to drive defensively. We need to do all of those things in cyberspace. There's no miracle there. Right? It's something we've done before. We must do it yet again. But that's only the first part of the strategy. 
Because if we do all of that and we have resilience by design in our roles and responsibilities, in our people skills, and the technology that's then bent to that purpose, what we'll have is a defensible proposition, but not one that's secure. These systems do not defend themselves. User participation is required. Right? Individuals, organizations, sectors, governments need to stand in and play a role in the defense of those systems. And in that, I think I bring to bear the second aspect of the strategy that's possibly new and novel, but that we can no longer do this using a division of effort. We can no longer say, you defend your piece of this shared infrastructure, I'll defend my piece of this shared infrastructure, possibly getting to that moment in, a, in an open boat where you say, holes in your side of the boat, so good luck with it. Um, turns out it's the same boat. We need to actually use our collective capacity to understand what's happening underfoot, to use the hunches and the shards and the insights that one of us might have to compare and contrast those with some party to the left or to the right of us so that we can discover and deal with things together that no one of us could have understood alone. Our UK counterparts have done that in something called the National Cybersecurity Center to good effect for the better part of five years. Our Israeli counterparts have done that. We've begun to do that in the United States actually to issue this idea that division of effort is the right strategy and to move forward to where collaboration, collected defense is the right strategy. Getting to a place where the slogan might be, if you're a transgressor in this space, you need to actually beat all of us to beat one of us. There's nothing offensive or aggressive about that. It's simply a statement of fact of for too long we've been crowdsourced by adversaries who have stolen, seized, and sustained their own initiative. We need to seize that back so that at the end of the day, we can get back on the trail that we were on in the early 90s, um, which is we had very positive, boldly, audacious expectations about what cyberspace would deliver, and that, therefore, is where we need to get back to. My role, along with many in this room, um, kind of all of us have some role, some responsibility to play, is to engage in that thought leadership to where we can define roles and responsibilities, we can get the skills um, up to speed, and we can then define and bring to bear the technology so that a collective defense on top of that can essentially deliver what we expect, what we want. Um, the relationship the United States has with Australia is an excellent example of how we can take that into the international domain, because the collaboration I'm speaking about must be done in the largest possible context. If we do that right, then we will have formed a new social contract, one that's not new or novel because we've done it in other domains of interest, but one that we can lift and shift into this space so that cyberspace can and will make our expectations. I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much for those remarks. Uh, you covered an awful lot in a short time on an enormous topic, so we can go many different directions with this. Uh, I find it especially refreshing the way that you are reframing all these cyber questions in a more positive light, getting us back on the good, as you put it. Uh, I'm going to start on the not good, though. Good. <laughs> but we'll get to the good. Um, Ukraine, of course. I want to ask you about the, the war in Ukraine and the consequences. Um, Australia yesterday attributed three sets of attacks, of cyber attacks to Russia related to Ukraine. Um, so the, 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 the questions are three. Uh, what should we expect from Russia next in cyberspace, especially if they continue to lose the conflict on the ground? Uh, what's China learning from this conflict? And should we still be thinking about, worried about a cyber Pearl Harbor? Yes, those are all good questions. Those are actually three very different questions. Um, perhaps I'll take them in reverse order, uh, or maybe kind of slightly reverse order. Cyber Pearl Harbor. And there's often a lot of discussion as to whether we should be kind of standing by for a Cyber Pearl Harbor or a 9-11 moment, um, which, which I think is possible, but less probable by the day, by the year. What's more likely is the slow, insidious creep of um, kind of weakness into this system in the ways that I've suggested in my remarks. Um, where what, what really is happening is there's, there's a slow rot right in the system, um, or there's a slow decay of confidence based upon that system. And that's what we have to worry about. It may well be that a cyber Pearl Harbor is happening all around us, even as we speak. It's just sufficiently diffused in time and space that we haven't had that collective appreciation of it. There hasn't been that shared cathartic moment. I think that's more likely, and, and therefore, the sense of urgency should be all the greater. We shouldn't wait right for that thunderclap um, it actually has a already happened or is happening in, in ways that are perhaps insidious in the nature of its onset, but, but have all the same effect in the longer term. Um, in terms of the Ukrainian situation, I would say the following, um, that um, we can all observe, I think, what we have seen in that space. The egregious bestial behavior of the Russians is not restricted to the kinetic space, the physical space. 
we've seen that in their disinformation campaigns, you know, what they tell their own people, what they attempt to tell those of us listening kind of in the open domain on the far side of this, right? That's egregious, right? It's kind of, you know, it's simply beyond the pale in terms of the way they have kind of twisted and corrupted um, the, their, their version of the facts. Um, but second, um, what they've done in kinetic space in terms of their attacks has been kind of replicated to, in cyber, cyberspace to some extent. Um, not broadly, not outside of the Ukraine, but certainly inside the Ukraine. This was a report published by Microsoft uh, about a week and a half ago. They actually described in great detail a series of attacks. Um, some of those have been further attributed, as you mentioned, by Australia, which recently is overnight. Um, another attack on some satellite communications was collectively attributed by various nation states um, as attributable to Russia. Uh, but they've been actually actively engaged in conducting attacks in cyberspace. The question before us is why they haven't attacked outside of the Ukraine, mm -hmm. and perhaps why they've not been terribly successful inside the Ukraine. Uh, I suggest, pun intended, that there may in fact be an analog in cyberspace, what we've observed right in the physical space, um, that the Russians exhibited a certain degree of arrogance and hubris going in, that they thought they might kind of own right outright the territory within a very short period of time, and therefore didn't take the time and trouble to conduct attacks um, that would then have made it more difficult for them to manage and administer the systems that they would inherit. Uh, may well be that it's harder than it looks, right? And the ability to do a campaign of the sort that we were worried about is harder, right, than um, either the Russians had imagined or that the Russians are capable of. May well be that the Ukrainians, and I think that this is the case, are very good at cyber defense, um, or at least good enough to blunt and kind of block and parry to a large degree um, that surprises um, the Russians. Um, and they've uh, to be honest, had eight years of practice given what the Russians have been doing all along that track. Finally, there's some degree of deterrence on the part of the Russians, self-imposed deterrence, um, where I don't think that they want to trip a full response right, from either NATO, the United States, or others. And so you can see that there's some self-imposed restraint there. Um, it's not a restraint that they've kind of exercised inside the Ukraine, but we've seen that outside of the Ukraine. Having said all of that, I think that our systems broadly across the globe, and certainly in the critical se sectors that uh, we care about in societies like Australia and the United States, are not impervious to attack. Uh, they're not self-securing. They're not as robust as we would prefer. And therefore, we have to be mindful that we're not through this yet, and, and we may yet be open to a further kind of attack that could succeed if we find ourselves in an unguarded moment allowing it to succeed. As to what the Chinese might be learning from this, I think that it's an experience of a vicarious sort that allows them to work their way through mm -hmm. um, what's working, what's not working, and kind of lift and shift that into their own context. I'll leave it to the Chinese or others to kind of imagine what their aspirations are. I can perhaps devolve secrets if I was in the right place, but it's a bit of a mystery as to the timing of what they're going to do, and that's a further matter. Um, but I would say um, that, that observing what the Russians are doing in that space, it may well be that the Chinese aren't concluding that that's the wrong strategy. It may be what they're concluding is not being competently executed. Um, and that would then be a further challenge for us. It won't dissuade the Chinese to observe what the Russians are doing. It may simply convince them that it's an, it's an aspect or a matter for execution. And we should therefore be all the more kind of um, careful about preparing for the possibility that this isn't the first or last time that we'll see this. On that particular question of attribution, are we getting better at attribution? And if so, why? But also, are we getting better at using attribution to change the calculus of malicious cyber actors? Yeah, I think the answer to those, those two questions is yes on both counts. Are we getting better at attribution? We are. I think that we kind of long ago realized that attribution in cyberspace, besides being hard, it is. Um, you know, what that old saw was, what one dog says to another about the, the value of cyberspace is nobody knows you're a dog. It's hard to attach a physical kind of reality to a persona in cyberspace. That being said, it's harder if you do it from a cold start. And so we don't do that anymore. We try to actually instrument our systems to have solid identification and authentication mechanisms. We have analytics that run across those systems so that it can understand behaviors in that system and essentially match those behaviors with kind of known persona in those systems. We actually, before some event of consequence occurs, have some knowledge of the neighborhood and the characters in that neighborhood so that kind of on a fairly short basis, if something untoward happens, you actually have the muscle memory and the context necessary to say fairly quickly, I think I know who that is. Mm -hmm. um, all of that done appropriately using either consent um, or the kind of the ownership and properties, the privileges attendant to those who are authorized to do that. But, but I think if we instrument these systems right, 
and we essentially say the cost of admission is you have to identify yourself and be known for kind of what you propose you purport to be, then I think attribution gets easier. Uh, does attribution make a difference? You betcha. You know, attribution allows us to quickly kind of take resources and apply those to either the interdiction or the eviction of something that otherwise, if it was anonymous, you wouldn't know whether this is simply a process that some innocent kind of well-intended person is running or something that is attributable to a malignant or malign actor. Um, attribution works especially well when in the broader scheme of things, um, you have found some actors who continue to transgress and transgress and transgress, and you want to bring all the instruments of power that a society, a just society, can bring to bear, whether that's um, a lawful arrest, whether that's some kind of restriction on travel, whether that's seizing assets, all of those things affect the decision calculus and in turn, right, the ability of that actor to hold us at risk. So attribution matters. Mm -hmm. Focusing more on, on defense and building resilience, which was a large part of your remarks, um, I think I'm right in saying that uh, a lot of those improvements in attribution are linked to a really quite a radical change in cyber doctrine in the US, which took place under the Trump administration, which is often summarized as the move to defend forward. Uh, I think that concept is probably not that well understood outside the US, so I was wondering if you'd be able to talk us through a bit more what that means in practice and if the way that is practiced has changed from the move, with the move from one administration to another. Yeah, um, so I, I would say that um, I would view what I've described as an emerging strategy um, as additive, that, that it actually complements you know, all of the tools that are already in this space. Um, I think I'll describe defend forward in, in a certain context, but say that um, if all you did was to defend forward, meaning if all you did was to understand what risks are being arrayed against you by certain actors, um, you'd be in a position where your homeland, uh, whether that's virtual or physical, undefended, um, would be at great risk, right? You therefore need to attend to your knitting at home before you then understand what risks may be arrayed against you abroad. Right. right? And so the resilience by design, it's, it's a concept that's probably thousands of years old, right, to make sure that you've attended to the resilience and robustness of the physical manifestations of your society, and in this case, the cyber extensions of that. Um, so what then is Defend Forward? Right, it's a concept that came into vogue about four or five years ago when it was used by the US Defense Department to say that kind of in the context of cyber threat, that they kind of, as a matter of doctrine, would persistently engage valid kind of cyber threats and that they would um, essentially, as a matter of doctrine, engage those as far forward as possible so that you achieved um, the earliest possible action with the highest possible leverage. But that's actually a concept that's been broadly applied in just about every other domain of interest. And I think it was high time that we caught up to it in cyberspace as well. And what do we mean by that? And we have long deployed troops in NATO forward, right, so that we have kind of an early engagement, a persistent engagement, if you will, um, and an ability that if there's a crisis there, that we kind of, as that crisis is on the rise, we're not mobilizing to that scene. We're essentially already there and we can defend forward. We do the same things with legal remedies. We do the same things with diplomacy. We have an expectation that there is broadly deployed all of these kind of possible kind of instruments of power, um, the issues of do we discern those issues early? Do we engage those issues early? Do we, with the highest possible leverage, bring those kind of back to heel so that we don't so much create a, a fuss, but rather solve it in the, in the most deft, kind of the, uh, the least offensive way possible? Mm -hmm. um, and so in my view, that forward defense is actually something that simply says cyber is an instrument of power. It's not the right response to all cyber issues. It therefore can be brought to bear in the constellation of all those other instruments that I mentioned in the same way that we brought those to bear in other domains of interest. So the trick to defending forward is, is doing it in the least offensive way possible, I think, is the way it you is. put it. Um, but part of the trick, I think what you're saying, the other part of the trick is not to forget to focus on pure defense and resilience, probably first and foremost. Australia is tripling its offensive cyber capability over the next 10 years. Uh, what can we learn from the US experience about how to use this capability in a way that doesn't risk turning cyberspace into even more of a battle space? I'm confident what Australia is doing hues to its kind of enduring values, which is that um, in our society, um, in Australian society, um, what we would characterize as offensive capabilities possessed by the military are an extension of defense. We call it in the United States, the Department of Defense for a reason. That's not a sleight of hand. That's not trying to, by rhetoric, kind of ignore what capabilities they can bring to bear. 
say that defense is the predicate to offense, and the offense must therefore be properly an extension of that defense. And so if there is some kind of increase in capacity for the offense, we must first make sure that it is a proper extension of the defense and that it achieves both the moral purposes as well as the kind of the effect purposes that are intended. I'm very confident that that's what Australia is doing. Just to clarify, so defend forward, you're situating very much then as part of the responsibilities of the Department of Defense and the military. But if I understand correctly, persistent engagement is something which takes place below the threshold of conflict. That's, that's, that's the whole idea, really. It should be going, going constantly and without being necessarily linked to. Well, that's true. So, so persistent engagement broadly across diplomacy and kind of the, the legal attaches and any number of others right, who are representing various instruments of power for nations deployed forward. Persistent engagement is almost always done below the use of force. And cyber is no different. Um, it might be particularly true in cyber where the vast majority of things that can be done in cyber do not constitute the use of force. Um, and, and that makes it at once um, something that is sometimes more attractive, especially in the hands of an autocrat right, who wants to perhaps achieve some effect um, without having the consequence of a response um, either in kind or um, the use of force. But at the same time, it, it makes it such that um, if you are in fact um, kind of persistently engaging those threats and you interdict those at the lowest possible level and, and always in a partnership that, that might be available to you, kind of unilateral is never the preferred method um, to do those in an international collaboration, um, you can in fact kind of achieve some order and discipline in the space because you haven't waited on shore for the problem to magnify um, the kind of analog or the analogy that I have loved um, for the years in thinking about this. So you can wait on shore for kind of a, a flock of arrows to arrive, or you can figure out where that bow is that essentially is aimed at you and simply make sure that the bow no longer works. Right? But again, it's a defensive mechanism. It's not an offensive mechanism. It must be properly characterized as responding to a threat as opposed to creating a provocation. I want to turn now to the, uh, back to China, but to the longer term threat posed by China rather than the more immediate daily cyber attacks. Um, China is advancing its own vision of cyberspace, of the internet, how it should work, the, the uh, new IP, for example. What's the best Western response to that? Should we be decoupling to, to build our own ecosystem, which is safer? Uh, or, or, or is the answer to, to continue to defend this uh, existing free and open, global, unfragmented internet? I think, the, I think it's more the latter than the former. Right? We don't seek competition or conflict. Um, we will collaborate whenever possible. We will compete when necessary. Um, and, and conflict um, is not the preferred choice. It's not the thing that we're attempting to set up. Um, what we're attempting to do, and it plays out in the ANZIG, um, kind of the ANZIS um, relationship that goes back, what now, 71 years, plays out in AUKUS, it plays out in um, the ASEAN relationship is to not so much kind of choose who we're against, but rather to choose what we're for. Um, and to then celebrate those values through the execution of various lines of effort that create security and resilience and, and the shared underpinnings of societies that essentially want to get on with the business of what they want to do with their resources. Um, China can choose to join that, can choose to complement that, can choose to compete with that or conflict with that. But that choice is largely China's. It's not a choice that we would drive them to one or the other of those options. I mean, one way you've done that recently, and we've done that as well, is through the uh, um, Declaration for the Future of the Internet, which 60 countries have signed. Uh, it's, it's a good positive step forward. Um, from an Australian perspective, though, uh, we look at the, the list of signatories, we see that India isn't there, and we see that no Southeast Asian countries are there. So I, the question for us really is, um, how do we continue to, to push for that single, open, unfragmented internet when what China is offering is often very attractive to a lot of countries that don't share our liberal democratic values? Well, first, I don't think we want to compete on an unlevel playing field. And we have to level the playing field by understanding what the values are that should essentially define that playing field. If we start with economics, which is often an, an important determiner in terms of what you choose to buy or what you choose to sustain, if you start with economics, then economics having no soul um, will lead you to a corner that on occasion you don't prefer. And so that declaration for the internet signed by 60 nations who don't all have the same geopolitics and wouldn't all agree about a, a vast number of issues, 
was in fact the foundation to say, this is what we want the character of the internet to be. Um, we want to be able to deliver digital infrastructure, the internet, that has the character of being free and open and resilient, um, and that we can then exercise our personal and societal aspirations on. Um, nations, if 60 nations can agree about that, well, they can't agree on to that level about any number of other things. I think that's the right start. The question then is how you then act on that. How do you create the technologies and the roles and responsibilities that deliver on those values and promises? We shouldn't make nations choose a geopolitical system, or even for that matter, to pick favorites amongst countries. Um, but we can, in fact, ask them to sign up and subscribe to common values mm -hmm. and then build on those values so that we transcend what otherwise would be difficult choices that, that are, at the moment, fraught. On the topic of building on common values, and this will be my last question, I promise, even though I have a very long list here, uh, you've made a very powerful and persuasive argument for a new cyber social contract, um, mostly addressed to the United States, I think. My question is, why a, a new social contract and why not just a more interventionist state that would compel the private sector to more actively protect private data, which would allow the state to go in and remove malware without consent when necessary. Some of these things that are happening already, but why, why do we need to frame it as a social contract? Well, two reasons. One, um, we're not going to shoot our way out of this. Right? We're not going to actually, by picking and choosing what we choose to allow into the system or not, and, and therefore trying to deny the access of transgressors, um, we're not going to essentially solve it by kind of solving the problem in, in the way I would describe it as responding to two and three alarm fires, right? If, if we did that perfectly, if we responded to every transgression, if we shut down every bad action in this space, if we did that with perfection in time, um, detection to time um, resolved, we'd just lose more slowly. Right. You have to have resilience so that you're actually preventing these attacks. This is a capital expenditure exercise for those that are involved in business, not an operational exercise. There's a role to be played for response but it needs to be that we've taken every effort necessary to avoid these problems in the first place. Um, having said that, um, this is not a vertical, right, where kind of government can essentially, at the top of that kind of pyramid, drive and dictate all the actions that take place in this space, and then everyone else follows that script, or perhaps kind of exercises broad roles and responsibilities that are wholly defined by government. This is a horizontal, right, what, what you find in terms of the way we build, we innovate, we create, sustain these systems is the vast majority of that occurs in the private sector, not in the public sector. Therefore, the government needs to think its way through how does it become a supporting organization for the activities that take place in the private sector that deliver critical functions, life critical functions, right, to the citizenry of a given nation. I think if we do that, we'll find that it's more about the roles and responsibilities horizontally and getting those to complement one another than it is about a vertical where you kind of script and dictate and direct that from the top down. It turns out it works that way in the physical world. I have by my own volition, I came here today in a kind of a manner of kind of a conveyance that I chose, right? I can choose to do that. I wasn't dictated to take some particular safe transport. So I came in one door or another. I could have walked, I could have ridden a bicycle, I could have taken a car. The government, however, plays its role to ensure that those systems have some inherent system of safety built in that the uh, roads are navigable and that we kind of remove the kind of major obstacles and threats and so on and so forth. But that's a horizontal. I still have broad discretion in terms of how I live my life in businesses similarly. We just need to make sure we do that in a rational system that actually has resilience by design built in, that I know what role I'm supposed to play in my own defense and that those complementary activities then line up horizontally to make the system that we want to have going forward. Well, thank you, Director Inglis. Uh, we have about 20 minutes for audience questions. Uh, if you have one, please raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. Uh, and if you are asking a question, please stand up, state your name and affiliation, and ask a brief question, which ends with a question mark. No statements or comments, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments, Yelena Park. I'm a freelancer right now. Um, I want to go back to the Russian-Ukrainian conflict and uh, ask you uh, about your opinion in terms of NATO. Uh, a NATO, um, so NATO, a few weeks, NATO. a NATO official commented yeah. that a cyber attack could be considered an armed attack. Could you elaborate what sort of cyber attack uh, 
should it be to trigger Article 5. And you already referred to sort of the potential response. Thank you. Yeah, that, I would say that that is at the moment unsettled um, kind of law or kind of doctrine at the moment. Um, I think that the question um, that would be before us, um, if a cyber attack was to be considered as uh, having the possibility of tripping Article 5, as to what the effects are, right? Not whether it's an attack as some might describe it in cyberspace, because a cyber attack very seldom has the same level of effect on life and health and safety as a kinetic attack, as a physical attack. So we need to take great care to look at that effect and consider it on its merits as opposed to kind of on the labels or the terminology we might wrap around that. Good to be back at the Lowy Institute after many, many years. Um, my name is Paul uh, Manoharan. I work for LexisNexis. Um, Director Inglis, thank you for that very insightful talk on cyber resilience. Um, and uh, of course, as we slip into a new uh, emerging world order, um, you know, that's a really critical um, um, space for all of us to um, invest and collectively work together. My question is rather, um, uh, about is there a need to create a global institution uh, along the lines of the old institutions like the Bretton Woods uh, system, uh, which would create a platform uh, from ground up as a means for like-minded democracies to collaborate and solve these emerging challenges? Thank you. It's a great question. Um, this is not an intact and kind of perhaps um, um, definable entity that has physical shape and form, even the way a financial system might, where you can say that the kind of transactions in a financial system kind of emanate from place A and they go to place B and that the pathways and the mechanisms by which they're processed and reconciled and considered are kind of discreetly definable. Cyberspace defies that. And, and therefore coming up with a single institution that might be kind of, you know, one kind of, one, one kind of organization to rule them all, um, if I can borrow a, a, a slogan. That's difficult. And so what I think we find ourselves doing is starting at the beginning, which is, can we first describe the values platform? That kind of declaration for the internet was, was an approach to that. Kind of the UN, the United Nations Global Group of Experts in 2015 and 16 defined norms, which are largely subscribed to. So that's a foundation for that. Then through bilaterals and multilaterals and kind of co coalitions that naturally already have an alignment on those common values, we can begin to build towards what you've described. But, but at the moment, cyberspace is too broad, too diverse, too ungainly for us to get our arms around as, as if we could, in fact, have a single point right, of influence on it to control or direct the efforts inside of it. At the back. Uh, Geraldine Duke from the ABC. I'd like you to elaborate, if you would, on the response you're getting from private players, I sort of I think you're implying that there's different, possibly sensibilities at stake there, and and you very, you know, keenly describe the permutations of it. But I wonder how, what sort of response they're giving you, because I wouldn't have necessarily thought they'd be totally keen to play. Right. First, I would observe that the private sector is not monolithic any more than many governments are not monolithic, um, and, and so you get um, kind of um, very variegated responses. Um, but second, I think that what we have found, um, following on the model of the United Kingdom, Israel, some others, um, is that if the government is truly sincere about we're going to put value on the table, we're going to give you things that would help you defend the private sector's component of the critical infrastructure, which is the vast majority of it, they'll show up. Right? And if you deliver on that, um, they'll come back a second time. And more importantly, they'll stay in between. They'll, they'll have a continuous relationship. What we need to make sure we do, however, is to protect, protect proprietary interest and privacy interest um, as a matter of design as opposed to we think about that at the end of the game. Right? So we say up front, this is what we want to achieve. We want to find and root out threats that hold us at common hazard. We're going to put on the table governmental kind of insights, perhaps some sense of best practices, things that are truly valuable that you couldn't do. Um, and we'll compare and contrast that with what you might be able to generate, discover and mitigate things together um, and maybe the together part is implicit collaboration because we can't achieve agency between these kind of private sector entities and the government, but essentially affect a new contract um, or a new compact 
that says, why don't we actually see if we can discover some things together that no one of us could discover alone. It's working um, at the moment. Um, I think the UK, which puts out a report on an annual basis, their National Cybersecurity Center, will give kind of some ample evidence to say that the concept is solid. The question is whether it scales into a very complex and diverse society like the United States. And so if we have a challenge at the moment, it's not a response from the private sector that's positive. It's how do you actually do this coherently across the very diverse kind of landscape that is the private sector. But, but I'm bullish on this. Um, I think a division of effort has shown itself to not work over time. And this, therefore, is all that remains. I'm going to ask another one that I think builds on those last two questions. You've posed the question, what do we owe one another in cyberspace as a way of starting to build those values and better allocate the risks and responsibilities for resilience? My question is, if we look at that internationally, what do states owe one another in cyberspace? But in particular, the role of the United States. What does the United States owe the rest of the world and what do we owe the United States given that the US is the home to the biggest and most powerful private tech organization? Well, the nation intends to have allies and both Australia and the United States do. And they view each other as an ally, not merely a partner. And what they owe each other is a declaration of what their shared prospects, their shared values, their shared intents are. And then they owe each other kind of a commitment to work through the various lines of effort that will then deliver on that. AUKUS is an example of that. Uh, but so are so many other lines of effort that actually join these two nations. And so kind of it starts with kind of declaring, affirming the shared values, but it must right, be followed through with how do we actually then, on the back of real work, give voice and traction right, to that declaration. Mm. and in particular the pace of that regulation and keeping up with the developments that are taking place in the area of critical infrastructure, uh, particularly maybe starting off with the United States because within the Australian context there's been quite a lot of work in that area and I'd just be interested in your thoughts on that versus your comments on the social contract. Yeah, so um, let, let me give a general remark about the role of regulation and then a very specific remark both about the Australian and the American experience. Uh, generally speaking, I think that as we have learned in other domains of interest, I've mentioned the aviation industry, the automobile industry, food, ther uh, food therapeutics, drugs. Uh, we have learned that self-enlightenment on the part of the manufacturers, the providers, takes you a certain distance down the road. Uh, they naturally want to do, in many cases, exactly the right thing. Market forces might take you a further distance down the road. That, that if it's a value that is respected by the consumers, then market forces will then deliver on that. But they often, and in most cases, don't take you far enough. There then remain some non-discretionary features that you have to specify and ensure are delivered. Air safety bags is one of those, right? If you wanted a cheap car, you might be able to go to some provider unless it's required and get such a car, right? So if this is a car that then broadly is going to affect aspects other than that individual consumer's choice, the state can and has stepped in to say this is not a non-discretionary feature. I think we're going to experience the same in cyberspace. For those digital infrastructures that support the critical functions, whether that's the generation flow of electricity, um, water supplies, all manner of things, we're going to find that there are some non-discretionary features and we'll have to step in and say, these are not discretionary and with the lightest possible touch, but no lighter, kind of ensure that that is in fact done. Um, now, let's talk about the specific experiences in both the Australian and the American experience. I spent some time with some folks who explained to me how Australia does this. And I think it's a quite brilliant scheme which says that, that, look, many of the things that we would regulate are already regulated because they show up in a sector that has long been regulated. Maybe the finance sector might be one of those. And so broadly, again, you know, the failure of my explanation is my kind of ability to explain it, not kind of the, the, the benefit of the system. Broadly, what I understand is that what then Australia will do is to say, we'll establish a floor that says, you know, what does, you know, the specification of function look like? for something that's critical in our society. What are the properties that those things need to have? What confidence do they need to give us? Um, and then we'll take a look to see whether that's already accounted for in some other scheme. If it is, we're not gonna re-regulate. We're not gonna double down on that regulation. We're gonna essentially say, look, it's already been done. But if it's not, we're then gonna stand in and we're gonna ensure that that gets done. 
seems to me to be sensible and efficient. Um, and at the end of the day, that cost being borne by society, I think is a necessary cost, right? It's no greater than it should be, but it's no lesser than it has to be. Um, in the United States, we haven't quite sorted all that out, right? You would have seen looking over our shoulder that uh, we had this kind of attack on something called the colonial pipeline not long ago, um, which kind of upon examination, there weren't specified requirements by the governing organization to essentially attend to the properties inside of that, which then meant that um, you know, even if, if the proprietors had said, we followed all the rules, they hadn't actually made it defensible enough and then defended it to the extent that most of our citizens would say it should be this and no less. Right? So we've stood in and essentially applied authority we've long had to that. But, but we can't do that episodically, and we can't do that unevenly across all the critical aspects of our society. We have to come to an understanding of what does critical mean, mm -hmm. um, what are the foundations of that, what's the floor, and what are the extensions of that in each of these critical sectors, and make sure we don't overregulate, um, such that we create an unfair burden for the intended benefit. Um, I wish it was a simpler answer, but it's a great question. Mm -hmm. While this one's coming, can I just ask you on critical infrastructure? I mean, that is the focus of regulation, but, and thanks very much for the kind words about our system, but whenever I look at uh, lists of critical infrastructure, they just seem to get longer and longer, and the incentives, at least bureaucratically, are to add to that list. How do we prioritise better? How do we make sure that critical infrastructure list is what is truly critical? My sense is that Australia is doing that, right? So that they broadly describe the categories, but then inside of that, they're very specific and intentional about saying, but, but before we declare an entity as being critical, let's understand what its role is. And, and let's make sure that we understand whether some of these things that we might think are critical are actually showing up in multiple systems. And so let's prioritise those. Let's bring those up a bit. Um, as opposed to what, what we had done in the past in the United States, we're moving off of this. I'm simply declaring that there are critical functions. Um, we have 16 of them, 16 sectors. Um, and then presuming, without specifying further, that everything inside of that system is critical. And therefore, everything is equally critical, meaning that you've set yourself up to defend all things against all perils. That's impossible. And so we have to actually be quite you know, intentional and precise about that. What's emerging in the United States is the sense that it might well be that we preserve the sense of these can be critical sectors, they're verticals, transportation, finance, energy, but that what we're gonna to begin to do is to cut across that to say, but the functions we really care about actually derive benefit from multiples of those. If you're gonna run an economy, you need a solid telecommunication system, solid finance system, you need electricity, possibly water to make sure that those plants operate properly. But when you pull that horizontal thread, you might then find a, perhaps a more succinct sense of what's critical and therefore double down on that's what I need to attend to and, and rationalize this sense of you can't defend all things against all perils to the few things that you want to prioritize and say that's what I'm going to work on. Thank you. Thank you. Giovanna Rarte. On this issue of critical infrastructure, I'm just wondering whether the, how the, the, the environment that we live right now, the political environment, has increased the exposure for attacks to critical infrastructure. Is there anything that individuals, common day citizens, can do um, to prevent or to prepare towards any type of attacks or cybercrime impacting on critical infrastructure? Uh, yes, there is. I wish I knew the names of the websites in Australia, but I'm sure they exist. But in the United States, um, our Department of Homeland Security has a rich array of websites that say, Look, if you're worried about ransomware, you run a small business, you have some intellectual property that's installed somewhere in a server or computer of yours, and you're worried about being the victim of ransomware, there's a website out there, stopransomware.gov, that, that quite succinctly says, this is what you can do to participate in your own defense. Um, and you wouldn't be surprised. Most of it's based on critical thinking applied right to the mechanisms that exist in cyberspace, whether that's about passwords, making intentional choices about what you, you store on the network, making backup copies, but, but I don't want to kind of enumerate all of those things just to say that there is a lot of guidance out there. I think what your question suggests, though, is can an individual do everything that's necessary to defend him or herself in a world where you don't need to be the target to be the victim? The answer, unfortunately, is no, which means that we need to allocate some responsibility for the creation of resilience and the sustainment of resilience across all of those parties who build, deliver, um, develop, deliver, deploy, operate these systems of interest. Today, as I indicated in my remarks, too often it devolves to that poor soul who's at the end of that supply chain, who given all of the critical thinking and kind of earnest effort in the world, 
probably isn't going to prevail when it's their turn in the barrel, you know, against a nation state that's come at them with some kind of overwhelming attack. Hi there, uh, Jonathan Pryke. I run our Below Institute's Pacific Islands program. Um, a challenge we have on top of just the immense challenge of just defending ourselves is to try and help our friends in the region better defend themselves. And the challenge there is just the capability gap is so immense. You know, these countries are run on Gmail and WhatsApp. I mean, Australia sometimes feels like that as well. But like just in, in Papua New Guinea, for example, last year, their entire integrated financial management system was hacked and held to ransom as they're going through a COVID, a massive COVID response. So where do we even get started? Like, how do we help these countries capability up when they have so many competing challenges that they're dealing with in the governance space? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think you start with some pretty simple questions um, and, and not to diminish the value of the model I'm about to suggest, but in the United States, and there are similar models here, there's something called the National Institute of Standards and Technology NIST framework, which essentially asks some very basic questions. All right, so can you identify what your critical assets are? Do you know what's on your network? All right, do you know whether you have personnel records out there or financial records or the customer database? Is that on your network? Yes or no? It's a very simple question. Um, do you believe that that is kind of something that you could afford to lose? Um, if the answer is no, have you got a backup copy? Pretty simple question. Um, if that's something that you couldn't afford not just simply to lose, but to have exposed because it's personally identifiable information or it's security critical information, security to your business, then do you encrypt it, right? And they're fairly standard encryption schemes that you bring to bear. But you begin to walk through those questions, which really don't require in the early kind of stage um, an application of resource dollars or the introduction of new technology. They're just simple questions. Do you know what your risk is? Are you prepared to then say, I'll accept that? And if you're not, are you prepared to make some investments necessary to essentially guarantee that you participate in your own defense, to guarantee some modicum of resilience because of the actions you've taken? Um, what I find often enough, though, is that there's a willful ambivalence on the part of organizations or individuals to say, I know there's a problem in this space, but it's not mine to fix. And they presume, assume, that somebody else is going to fix it. And that's a flawed assumption in just about every case that I've, that I've experienced. That's not to say that I've offered you something that's kind of you know, the magic bullet, you know, the silver bullet. Um, we can't treat this as kind of something that a panacea would, would solve. But, but I think there are some basic questions when you begin to ask those that lead you to some kind of fundamental considerations. Um, and then just like navigating kind of a busy city street might be overwhelming to a small child, it can be done. Right? We have to actually make it such that those things are navigable. We have to make sure that we teach people how to navigate them and that all the parties necessary participate in the creation of that resilience, the sustainment of that resilience, and the defense of what happens in that space. Uh, David Masters from uh, MasterCard. Um, uh, increasingly, corporates are um, facing the challenge of being asked around the world by governments to localize their businesses. Um, do you see that as a legit, in, in the interest of national security and cyber security, do you see that as a legitimate uh, request from sovereign states? It's certainly the right of those sovereign states to ask for something like that. We have to think our way through whether or not that's going to achieve the intended purpose, which is to make that data safe, right? Or whether it's going to somehow deny us the opportunity to kind of use analytics that run across that data. Um, to derive insights and kind of extensions of, of what uh, those analytics might offer that they're going to say we can only kind of understand and deal with issues if we compare, contrast, combine the, the information. So I just think that the initial concern that if I localize my data, I then defend myself in a silo because I've concentrated that risk in a single place, whether that's an inappropriate concentration of risk, it then might become a more viable target for somebody who would go after it. And it might deny us the opportunity to use the breadth of cyberspace and the analytics that run on top of that. Um, so there's not a simple yes, no question, but we have to think our through the fullness of that. The second and third order consequences are often not considered and, and are often misunderstood. No, Malcolm? I thought. Uh, Elliot Brennan, I'm a security analyst. Um, you've spoken and written previously about the democratization of the tools of cybercrime. Was it surprising to see how many non-Russian aligned groups quickly volunteered themselves as proxies in the Russia-Ukraine conflict? And is there a concern that in the future they may 
turn their sights towards the US and its allies? Uh, yes and yes. <laughs> I think it goes without saying that you know all of us. I think uh, most of us, if not all of us, um, kind of wanted to to, fi to figure out you know when this happened, when the Russians transgressed in this abhorrent way into the Ukraine. What can we do? So dropping a dollar in a box or sponsoring kind of you know some some fund that that is within our kind of wherewithal legally permissible to do, and therefore kind of like you would encourage that. But but taking it upon yourself to stand into a role that. Um, kind of is inherently the role of government to deny, destruct things that are outside of your kind of um, your authority. You don't own that territory. That's problematic, and, and we have to think our way through the question you asked, which is, it might be that at the moment that kind of favors the interest that we would prefer, and we're therefore kind of sitting up in the bleachers saying, you know, yay for the home team. But that can turn around on a dime and kind of be reflected back, and that's why we restrict those authorities and capabilities to governments, which are accountable to the people that elect and sustain them in office. Okay, uh, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, I want to thank you again, Director Inglis, uh, for, for joining us and sharing those insights today. Thank you very much. Um, uh, th th just to let you all know that the, the video from this session will appear on YouTube later today for those who weren't able to make it in person. Um, in closing, I'd just like to thank the events team at the Lowy Institute for their tireless work behind the scenes, especially to my colleague, Sasha Fegan, as well as to uh, Jim Kerbin from the US Consulate for bringing this event to the Institute today. And thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.